chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh, and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth. Oh, come and chat with Nick. Hello, everyone. I'm super excited to have Julie Livingston live out of New York talking with us today. Normally I ask where in the world you are, but I, I, I had to spoil that for, for the audience because it, it's so cool <laughs> to say City, that. New York City, the big apple. <laughs> exactly. So, Julie, you are a public relations and LinkedIn specialist. So that is an area that you have taken control of. And I've had a look at some of your articles, your website, and I've seen some of the work that you've done. And you obviously practice what you preach and have dealt with some fantastic clients, both in New York and in some other areas. Julie specializes in raising the visibility of senior leaders by developing their thought leadership and media placement to strengthen competitive advantage, make sure that staff are retained and that their stakeholders are happy with who's leading the organization. So I'm oh, sure to make somebody... sure that their brand is really the one on everybody's lips when they're talking about their particular industry. Well, let's, let's maybe, before I go into your, your, well, let's go into your background and then let's, let's go back into personal branding, because I think that's obviously a huge growth area at the moment that we need to look at. So, Julie, who are you? Where have you come from? And how did you start your, your business? Well, I'm a born and bred New Yorker. You can probably hear that already. Grew up near John F. Kennedy Airport in Queens, actually, right outside of New York City. And I've had a long love affair with media, actually starting as a kid. Would you believe I was the first girl in my neighborhood to deliver a local newspaper? And I really, you know, I really believe that that kind of set me on this path. I was always fascinated with the news and with telling stories. And so when I was in college, my goal was to become a fashion editor. And living in New York, you know, fashion capital of the world, that was kind of a big goal because I was... Nobody. My parents were not socially connected, but through sheer perseverance, I landed an internship at a magazine called 17, for, which is for teenage girls. It's still around. And that kind of launched my career. I love, I, and, and my first job out of college was as a fashion editor at a magazine that one of the editors at 17 was helping to revive. And that was a wonderful experience. And one of the things I learned as a fashion editor was that I was being pitched by, by publicists who were representing fashion and beauty brands, clothing brands, who wanted me to feature their product in the magazine. And I started get, being really intrigued by that process. And eventually, after being a fashion editor for four or so years, and I loved it, it was great. I wanted to do something a little bit more substantive and that would involve writing because I was a strong writer and I had started writing columns for this publication. And so I decided to pivot. This is one of many career pivots I've made into public relations. Now, back then when I was in school, there really wasn't a public relations track. I know you teach, Nicholas, but there was not a communications track per se. You studied mass, mass communications. That's what it was called. So eventually I, I got an in and through networking, got my first public relations job. And it just fit like a glove, although there was room for me to grow into it. And I've been in that field to this day, decades later. And it's something I really still enjoy public relations. And it's, I think I, one of the reasons is because every day it's something different. And you're constantly problem solving for clients. And I just love that. I love the, I love the creative challenge. I do love the writing part of it, which can be very, very tricky and, and challenging at times. But I also love being able to counsel, provide strategic communications counsel for a variety of clients in many different industries and, and have them listen to me <laughs> at least some of the time anyway. You know, because I have good judgment and because I'm a seasoned professional, I offer a, a kind of maturity, mature decision making that I think clients can benefit from. And so I really still to this day find that public relations still gets me excited. You know, it's also provided such a wonderful opportunity to keep learning. And in fact, 
I, I went back to graduate school just 13 years ago, so much later in my life. Got my master's degree at Syracuse University at the Newhouse School, which is pretty well known in the United States and maybe around the world. And so I still, at that age, had fine tuning to do and things to learn. And certainly with the advent of digital technology, oh my gosh, there's public relations is changing constantly. And certainly, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about the future, but with the advent of AI and artificial intelligence, the communications field is just constantly evolving. So it still turns me on. I love it. Absolutely. Well, a couple of interesting points you brought up there and something I want to touch on, which is perhaps an art that might be lost with the advent of AI. I've, I've written quite a few things on using ChatGPT. I say, please write it in the, in the style of John Simpson and in the style of XYZ Hunter S. S. Thompson. And they, and they come up with some really weird and wonderful things. But your days as a columnist, you are basically like a, a chef. The order comes in, you've got to get it out. In terms of learning your craft, how important was your, your, were your days as a columnist? And would you suggest to people to write and write and write oh my and write gosh. under a deadline. T I cannot say enough about honing your writing skills. And it is something I do every single day. You're never finished. But I see, I have interviewed and I've had so many interns over the course of my career, young people who I, you know, try to take under my wing and guide and, and mentor. And often the writing skills are not there. And you cannot, I'll say it again. You cannot succeed in the public relations and marketing and advertising fields without having writing skills. You cannot rely on AI. AI is only a tool to help you combat, you know, road, you know, when you have a mental block and you need, a, when you're having writer's block, you have to know how to write. You have to know grammar. You have to, in my world, you have to speak English fluently. And there's just no, you can't cheat that. You have to know it. I'm so glad you said English, not American. So we're on the, on the, on the same page there. Yeah. <laughs> in, ter in terms of working at Seventeen Magazine, obviously writing on those topics must have, been, must have been challenging day after day. How did you get your inspiration and how did you keep it fresh? Well, I started learning and I was, I was very young. I was just out of college. You know, you have to reinvent the story every month. Every month I was responsible for writing a column about hair, hair styling, whatever, hair care, and one on fragrance. And I had to step into both of those worlds. I had to immerse myself. I had to really learn about the products. I had to learn about skin, hair, you know, the, like the medical part of it, right? The health part of it. And I had to learn how to do research because just because a publicist might have sent me a press release or a press package on a particular product, I couldn't, I, I wasn't, I didn't want to sell that product. I wanted to describe it from a user experience. You know, did I think it was worthwhile? Did I, you know, what did it, what were the benefits of it? What were some of the, the pros and cons? I really had to have, I really had to learn critical thinking. You know, I couldn't just take something that a publicist sent me and be like, okay, I'll just copy that and put it in the magazine. That wasn't going to fly. So I really had to learn how to give it an editorial standpoint and kind of, in some cases, review the products or talk about trends. We did a lot of talk about, you know, what's hot, right, for, for teenagers to wear or to, to look like, how to put makeup on, that kind of thing. So I really had to learn a lot of that. And I had to constantly tell myself that I didn't know everything. You know, I, I, with all due respect, when I, when I do work with a lot of young people, sometimes the attitude is, well, I, I know all this. You don't have to tell me. I don't have to learn anything. Not true. Yeah. Not true. If you're writing something for a client, you have to really know that service or product inside out. You have to study the competition and know what they're up against so that like what makes them special. It's not just because you think they're special or you say they're special. Why? What are, the, are those unique selling points, those characteristics, those brand differentiators 
that are going to make them different in the marketplace? And why should people care? And so I would say that that thought process started when I was a young editor. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I, again, I think the importance of repetition in this type of role is very important. So the next one that you do just gets easier and easier and easier and easier. Yes and, and no. Talent, you know, and yes and no. I mean, when you're an editor, you're, you're working against an editorial calendar, right? You have themes that are mapped out for the whole year. And so every month you kind of, if you're writing a column, you have to kind of make it look fresh somehow. And that's always easy. Yeah. Well, my, my grandfather was a, an editor of, and a, a journalist at this sort of top daily in, in Cape Town in South Africa. And he had to write a column every day. And he died young because <laughs> too much smoking from and drinking oh, oh. from the stress. I mean, trying to be the top columnist where people are going to read your article every day is a, is a tremendous stress, obviously. But anyway, I'm sure, I'm sure you've had enough stress from your writing days. I, I want to talk about how PR has changed from when you started out, because I also worked quite a bit in, in PR, but how it has changed now into this digital age. Do we oh still need PR? Do the traditional yeah. channels still work? What are new ways that we can utilize PR, which like you said, it's not just selling a product. It is, or sometimes it is, but it's not. It's but trying to influence others, no. persuade others, influence others, inform people in such a way that they'll remember what you're talking about. It's completely, PR has completely changed. You know, it used to be when I was in the consumer product space, it used to be that you would put together, if you were on the product side, you know, for example, when I worked at Scholastic, the global children's publishing company, you would put together a press packet, you send out a press release on the national newswire, Maybe you'd follow up with some reporters. Maybe you would just kind of spray what we call spray and pray. You know, you would send physical product in the mail by, or by messenger because I was in New York. You know, we would sometimes send product packages by messenger to reporters who were always in an office. This is completely different. Mm. Some things for the better, some things make it a little more challenging. So today... You really, I mean, while I do sometimes send press announcements, I do sometimes write press announcements for clients. It is much more rare of an occurrence. And when I do, sometimes I'll put something out on the National Newswire if it has, you know, we have so many thousands of news outlets here in the United States, and we have the ability now through digital channels to target different regions around the world with our company news. So sometimes I might do that, but really today you have to, you have to cultivate and develop relationships with reporters. And even if you don't know them, you have to develop a list of that is very fine, fine tuned so that you are really getting the names of the journalists and their contact information um, who cover the beat that, or the, the sector that you are promoting. So if it's technology, if it's management consulting, telecommunications, pharmaceuticals, whatever that is, you have to really know the reporter, the reporters, because here in the States, there could be many reporters that cover healthcare, but which ones cover pharmaceuticals and which ones cover, I don't know, Medicare or, you know, different kinds of insurance plans, um, you have to be really specific. You really have to find their niche and get that person's uh, contact information. You have to know their history of coverage. Whereas before you, you could, you didn't have to be as targeted. You would sort of just send it out to a bigger, a bigger group. Now it's really a question of drilling down and sending out materials digitally. The, 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 the days of the press package, the, you know, the hard copy press package, are, I think are kind of over. I mean, unless you're promoting a book, and most books now have digital versions, you really you probably don't really need to send out physical product anymore. Unless you're looking for product reviews for like a toy or something like that where, where the reporter has to, has to have hands-on experience with the product. In addition, we have, I think, helpful tools here in the States anyway, where you like, Quoted is one. 
Q-W-O-T-E-D. I don't know if you're familiar with that one. Or we have another one called Help a Reporter Out, where journalists <laughs> yeah. actually can post what they're looking for, the kind of sources and subject matter experts that they're looking for. These are really, I think, really good tools. And I have been able to get use those platforms to help get clients, especially those who are relatively unknown, to get in front of major reporters. So that's been really good. That we didn't have years ago at all. Yeah. We used to have, back in the dark ages, we used to have a book of media contacts, a media database, and every year you would get a new book. I mean, now, first of all, people change jobs so much more often than they did back then. So now we have a digital media database. I use something called Muckrack. That's pretty helpful, but still not always up to date because there's so much movement and so much change. One of the big things that has changed um, in the world of public relations is the reachability and accessibility of journalists. It's much more difficult today to actually connect personally with a journalist. Many journalists, if not the majority, are freelance now. They're not necessarily employed by one media outlet. So, and they're certainly not sitting at a desk in a newsroom. They're probably working from home somewhere, which could be anywhere across the country here in the U.S. So you probably will never get their phone number unless somehow you got to know them and they share that with you. That is usually not in, a media, in the media da database that I, that I use. Sometimes, sometimes, but rarely, you'll usually get an email address. So you better write a really good pitch to stand out among all the hundreds that they get. So it's much more difficult to follow up as a result. Well, I was going to say, I, I was going to say the, the quality of your pitch has to be really tight now. And I think that's, again, something that ChatGPT won't Writing, be able writing, to yeah. writing, writing. Yeah. So that, that takes us on to our, our next topic, I guess, which is LinkedIn and how that's changed your world and how how valuable you think that is in terms of the PR work that you do. Do you see that as a PR channel, as a relationship I do. generating channel? How, how, how would you describe LinkedIn to an alien who came down from space and said, <laughs> you know, I, need you to a, build, I need to build my brand? I'll tell you a little story, Nicholas. About four years ago, I was on LinkedIn. You know, I had a LinkedIn personal page and I was, I, I was starting to increase my presence on, on the platform by posting more consistently about executive visibility and kind of the work I do as a publicist, building brand awareness, reach, you know, connecting with target stakeholders. And somebody I knew started noticing, well, a lot of people were noticing I was getting engagement on my post, but one woman in particular who I had met maybe a decade earlier, she was a client prospect, but never became a client of mine, but she continued to follow me on LinkedIn. I did not know that. So that's what we call lurking. She was lurking <laughs> on my profile and she started noticing my content. She was now at a Fortune 500 company uh, as a chief communications officer. And she, the person she was reporting to, a female executive in a very senior role, you know, in the, in the executive suite, she really, that leader was not really on the radar within the organization, very large company that she needed to be in order to exert her influence and continue to climb up the ladder. And so the company was considering a LinkedIn campaign, a LinkedIn initiative on her behalf. And my, my colleague said she knew just who to call because she had been following me. And honestly, I had never really thought of it, of, of LinkedIn as a public relations tool or even a service that I could market until that point. And so I'm now in the third year of that program, and it's been phenomenally successful in moving the needle for this executive. You know, I think she started with 7,500 followers. We're now up to 15,000. And the engagement has been remarkable from across the company. People are now talking to each other on her feed, and I'm creating her content. And, you know, we've developed content themes, content pillars that she kind of owns. Those are the kind of the lanes that she swims in regularly that she's now known for. And people are really engaged and interested in it, that they, they tell her that they look forward to seeing the content, that they're sharing it. 
and that they feel like they know her. So do I, to answer your question, I know this is a long-winded way of answering your question, Nicholas, but do I think that LinkedIn is a primary public relations tool? I do. And I think it is very often underutilized by executives, by anybody, who a lot of people still use LinkedIn as a resume, and it is way more than that. And in fact, if you're using it as a resume, you need to read up about what LinkedIn is today because it is a digital marketing platform. It is a way to build your business and build awareness of who you are as a person, as whether you're a manager or a leader in your company, whether you're a business owner or entrepreneur, you must have a strong presence on LinkedIn in order to survive because your yeah. competitors are there. Oh, yes. Well, I've, I've done this with all, all of my classes. We, we have a LinkedIn day where I say, okay, show me your LinkedIn pages. And That's these are great. folks who are doing digital marketing. I've done it with user experience teams. I've, and designers who don't have banners, they've got photographs of them who are 18, you know, on a beach with the bikinis, et cetera, or a weird hat. And I'm like, there's some fundamentals on, on LinkedIn that you, need, that you need to get right. It and is a use business it like, platform. It is, yeah. a bit, is not Facebook. No. Oh, and that, that takes me to one of my bugbears is when people say happy birthday, uh, happy Friday. It drives me up, up the wall. But uh, b besides that, there are a lot of leaders out there who work behind the scenes. Some of them lurk behind the scenes because they are, they are more technical people. They want to be seen as, you know, the people behind the business driving the business. They don't want to be seen as the face of the business. Perhaps they feel uncomfortable because they don't feel they've got anything in smart or they don't have a witty phrase to say. They might be camera shy or they just don't want to get in trouble by saying the wrong thing on, on LinkedIn. Are the, what are some of the challenges that you have to face when trying to drag some of these executives onto LinkedIn? Well, that's a great question, Nicholas. The first thing I'll, I do when I work with an executive on this program is to identify their personal core values. The things that are telling about their personality, who they are as a human being, that are non-negotiables, you know, whether it's knowledge, integrity, honesty, trustworthiness. These are things that I need to know up front. But so Julie, I kind of I kind of ask them about that and get to know them. And then we we identify content pillars that align with those personal core values. And really it doesn't matter what level you are in your career, these, these things are relevant. And if you're, you don't have to be on video on LinkedIn, although it's helpful to mix up, to mix up the media that you use, but you don't have to, it can be written, but you can start to promote yourself in a lot of different ways that I'll share with you. These are micro steps that you can take to build your presence on the platform that could be very valuable. So the first thing is, is to update your profile and really leverage all of the tools and features, all the bells and whistles that LinkedIn continues to introduce new things all the time. So the profile is the first thing, really. Make sure you have a nice headshot. It doesn't have to be a professional headshot, although I would recommend one without like a lot of things in the background, just very simple. And then, you know, that area in back of your headshot, the background header, that is probably the most underutilized real estate, but the most valuable real estate on your profile. So I really like, I always get clients to, we always create a graphic back for that area that kind of telegraphs what the person is about. For example, I have a client, a nonprofit client, she has a foundation that informs the public about the side effects of medicine, we put that language, a very simple one sentence up there with her logo and the URL of her website. So that's something that an introvert can do very easily, right? And then make sure that you're using the other features. For example, if you use the featured section, which is sort of like a theatrical marquee, you can post like a slideshow about, you know, articles that maybe that you've written for the industry or for your company. Maybe it's a blog you write. 
maybe it's a photo of you at an industry conference giving a presentation or even a, a meeting at work or a staged photograph of you with the rest of the team. These things really showcase your personality without, and I think, I think they are workable solutions for no matter what your personality is. And certainly filling out your about section and your experience section and, you know, the skills. LinkedIn allows you to kind of tick off some skills to make that, that you're really well known for so that you're more searchable on the platform. But really take time to go through and update your, your profile. And then one of the other first things you can start to do is to post articles that you think are interesting and write a few sentences about them. Let's say you found, you saw an article in an in industry trade publication that was on a topic that is was particularly timely. Maybe you have, you know, a thought or two or two about it. Post about it. Tag the publication and the journalist who wrote it and post it. Start with posting once a week. Start just start with once a week. Just that's a micro step that you can take toward increasing your visibility. Also, LinkedIn now has, it's an AI tool where you, you can, you can comment on articles that they have written. I have mixed feelings about this because sometimes, but because a lot of those articles do sound like they've been written by AI. However, they do help people raise their visibility on LinkedIn. And I think it's a wonderful entry point for people who want to start getting their thought leadership out there. They will send you prompts for these, for these opportunities to comment. I don't know why I'm forgetting that what they, what they're called on LinkedIn at the moment. It's, um, it's, un, it's under the content creator mode. Right. You, Contri see, it's a see, contributor see, opportunity. So you could have the, yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah, they, they give quite, it's, it's quite targeted, which is nice. And you can just yeah. put it, you don't have to write an essay. It can just be a you couple don't. of words on your thoughts on those, That's on those right. particular topics. But something more substantive than, oh, I like this article, you know, something more than that. But that is a great way. And, you know, a friend of mine just got a special badge for being a top contributor on LinkedIn. So that's an, because she does them a lot. So I think that's another way you can make yourself stand out um, on LinkedIn by starting to do that. And again, start by doing these things once a week. And then building up to twice or three times a week, you'll get more traction over time. But it's also practice. I think the if you set yeah, yourself that practice. I've got to do it once, twice, you get a bit more comfortable with it. Something something that you mentioned resonated with me a little bit, and it's finding what are the what are the core of your personality, or what can, what do you bring to the table in terms of being a leader, and. I feel that some leaders don't know what this is. Even at a later stage in their life, they don't know whether it's uh, compassion, honesty, whatever those terms are. Do you work with leaders in terms of trying to extract yeah. that juice, in terms of trying to find what is, what yeah. is, what is special about you? How can, I, how can I sell you? How can you sell yourself? Yes. Sometimes I work with them directly on this. Sometimes I work with their marketing communications departments. I work sort of as an adjacent partner to them. And we talk it through and then we make a recommendation. And then and that leads to creating these content pillars. So those are the, the that's those are the content themes that you have to kind of constantly reinvent, right? To make that content fresh every month. A problem lots of people have is that they get bored of the same content pillars. They want to do new pillars the whole time, new content, new things. Why is that a bad idea? Because repetition on digital media is critical. You know, people today are barraged with so much stim news and so much, so many, there's so many, so much stimuli out there, you know, vying for everybody's attention. But if you become known for just a few things and you just repeat your commentary on those things over and over and over and over, you know, the marketing rule of thumb is that it takes seven impressions to drive home a, a message to make it memorable. It's the same thing on every kind of digital media. Yeah, I think that consistency, as you mentioned, is important. And I think people need to realize that not every single post that you see is going to be seen by everyone, all of your connections and all of the folks that's you. They might see one every now and then, which that's is why right. it's so important. It's sort of keeping yourself on the radar by posting on a regular basis 
and posting on the days and times when people are really active on the platform. Yeah. So for example, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays during, you know, business like the morning between eight and 10 AM in your time zone are usually the best times. <laughs> I do have one client where we're experimenting with Mondays because we posted a few times on Mondays inadvertently and we did get some good traction. So you could play around with that, but some people like posting on Sunday nights, but I would say Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Wednesday seems to be the highest, most highly traffic day on LinkedIn. So try to post that, post that, yeah, but follow are- and also follow people, follow the other leaders or p- peers in other industries or in adjacent industries, see what they're doing. How can you be a little different? Yeah, well, I followed you on LinkedIn, so hopefully you'll be, I'll be seeing some more of your, your posts uh, so. uh, in the near future. You spoke about one of your clients grew their followership, yeah, followership from, is it followership? My, following. Yeah, following. following. <laughs> I'm thinking of church terms now. They're following from seven and a half up to nearly 20,000 followers. Engagement, having followers is great, but engagement is the most important metric here. No question. So t- I've got 5,000. I'm actually just about to hit 5,000. When you follow me, awesome. I might get closer to my, to my goal. But I get very little engagement. What am I doing wrong? How can I get engagement up on, on, on my page? You know, I was dealing with just this question for one of my clients the other day. She runs a small women's leadership organization. And I don't know. I've been a little frustrated. I do her ghostwriting for her and her content content creation, but the engagement has been a little lackluster. So there are a few things you can do. First of all, revisit your content to make sure that it's relevant for your audience and really be very specific and try to step away from it a little bit. Like I know, you know, I know we want to love everything that we do for ourselves, but, and, and ask people around you, like, you know, Ask them to look at your content and give you feedback and listen to it. Listen to it. The other thing is you really need to work with the LinkedIn algorithm, which is constantly changing. And they've recently just made a lot of updates to it. There are a few things they want to see. They want to see that you're actively engaging on the platform, not just pushing content out there. So it's possible that you're not commenting a lot on other people's posts. Maybe you just click the like, you know, you just click like or you repost something without a comment. So try to do at least a few times a week, try to comment with substance, not just Mm. like, I agree, you know, great post. No, really a thoughtful comment that the, the algorithm will pick up. The other thing is try that AI, the collaboration AI feature that they've introduced. Start adding your thought leadership to those when those opportunities come up for you and make sure LinkedIn is currently um, reviewing their hashtag policy. This has been such a pain for me because, you know, for years we thought hashtags were really what would help you get uh, your content seen by the right people on LinkedIn. I'm not sure how it's going to work out and their search tool for the, the, Um, effectiveness of different hashtags is not working right. Mm. So you can't even look in the search tool like hashtag public relations. I don't even think anything will come up for you when you do that right now. So eventually, if they continue with hashtags being important, you have to kind of figure out what hashtags to use, the right ones that have more than 10,000 followers each. Otherwise, your content, you know, may not be seen by the right people. And then look at the content itself. It's not just writing something really good, but it's also, for me, it's the formatting of it. So it's making it look appealing so that it's easily scannable so that when somebody sees the post, their eye goes to different paragraphs. So it shouldn't all be lumped together in one paragraph. Break it up. You might even want to use subheadlines. I like using some tasteful emojis, like <laughs> colored circles to break up. I, I like bullet points. Bullet points are very scannable. Tips, very scannable. Actionable tips, especially, are great. 
And then end every post with a call to action. So what do you want people to do after they read your post? You want them to think about it, right? You want them to engage and think about it and hopefully comment or share it or like it. So add, add, always add a question at the end. I always end every post I write with a question such as from this client in the side effects space, you know, have you recently read the, the, the label on the medicine you just got for side effects? Oh, as a reader, I'm going to think, oh, you know, I don't know if I have. And so anyway, it just starts that it starts initiating a relationship with the reader. Well, it's, go it's going to some basics of communications. I mean, the whole point of communications is to get yeah. is to have get some kind of call to action. You want them to download something, respond, do something, even if it's just feeling an emotion. So I think that's. I, I mean, I feel I feel a bit itchy now. I feel I should get get writing an article. But you know, <laughs> there are other things I do too, and I'm always experimenting, Nicholas, because there's there's no real rubric for this. There's some guidelines, but you have to find your own ways. I have found recently that polls are a very good engagement tool for certain clients. And I have seen over time, like I introduced polling for one client, the Fortune 500 client. And at first, the first poll we did about six months ago, yeah, it was okay. The second, a little more engagement. And now it's fantastic. So you may have to build it up a little bit. So polls are good. Uh, video content is fantastic. LinkedIn loves video content. I happen to record a LinkedIn live show every week called PR Patter, where I have conversations with people across my public relations and marketing network. So that's live video. And I think that that, that definitely feeds well into the algorithm. Using colorful graphics, you know, now we have tools like Canva that allow you to really make professional looking graphics. I have been finding that word cards that I create in Canva are really resonating. I'm getting a lot more impressions and engagement on those posts. Can, just touching on Canva, it has disrupted this industry so much. I mean, imagine having Canva 20 years ago. <laughs> Unbelievable. And, it? and theoretically free. I mean, there's the, the, the premium version as well, but what a fantastic uh, platform. And they just keep adding and adding and adding brilliant things. So it's keeping it's wonderful. Adobe on its toes. And I remember I was a fan of Shutterstock many years ago. And one of my most popular articles, which got, you know, tens of thousands of views, was about how Shutterstock has killed graphic design. And it looks like Canva I think my next article should be how Canva killed Adobe and, and Shutterstock. So it's just unbelievable. It's kind of amazing. This... It's amazing. And there, there was, they were sort of a renegade brand, you know, like. Oh, and, and designers and lots of people poo poo it as, oh, you know, it's got lots of templates and things, but look at the, the speed of the speed that we need to get communications out. You can't necessarily wait to give a brief to designer. Sometimes if you've got enough, you have a creative eye, you can just, Bang it well, and for, yeah, and certainly for LinkedIn graphics, you know, I think that in certain cases, it depends. You don't, it does not have to be a very high end look and feel. It should definitely be sophisticated on some level, but you know, it's going to live on the platform so briefly that you want it to look good, good enough. You want, but I have to tell you, I actually, I don't think I'm great on Canva, but I have, I'm getting better the more I use it. But I actually have my graphic designer use Canva sometimes. Like I'll say to her, because they have such great templates, like they have the LinkedIn background header template. So yeah. she's got the measurements there. All she has to do is kind of fill it in. And sometimes you could, you know, you could adapt the templates that they have and make them look even better than they do on Canva. Exactly. So, I mean, you can have the tools, but uh, it can still look awful if you, <laughs> if you don't know how to use it. Yeah. Julie, we could keep going on for, for quite a while. <laughs> I, I, want, I want to talk to you about 2023 and onwards for you. It's, we're post-COVID. We are going into some very sort of choppy times, but interesting and exciting times, new businesses, new opportunities, growth around the world. What does 2023 and beyond look like for you? 
Well, I'm still really excited about my business. And I think that the role of providing strategic communications counsel to executives and companies could not be any more important these days. We live in such a complex society, a global society. There are so many things going on where, you know, you need a fresh set of eyes and good judgment and somebody who's kind of tuned in to what's going on to guide you and how you should communicate well, how you should communicate effectively with different stakeholder audiences. So I think the future is bright. In terms of what's coming down the pike, I think that artificial intelligence will continue to kind of upset the apple cart. And really, we need to look at it more deeply and see and really think of it as um, a vital business tool. I don't, you know, I guess in certain cases, AI will take over human functionality. However, in my world, it cannot. It cannot take over the human touch. That said, AI is really valuable in combating writer's block, you know, in helping with research. Oh my God, it's amazing. And with helping you to get started on something, you know, sometimes you need like an idea prompt to kind of get you going, but then you have to really customize it and shape it in your own voice and using your own colloquialisms and your own language. You can't just take what AI spits out and use it verbatim. And in fact, you'll see that if you do that, Google will not, you will not come up on Google. You know, you're not going to, it's just not going to work well for you. So I say, use it, use it. It really can help you a lot in your business and do it in, 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 in creating more efficiencies. I think that there is a lot of, they have a lot of new exciting AI tools coming our way, but it cannot replace the human touch and the human brain that a, a real public relations professional provides. Well, I, I think humans have a built-in bullshit detector and, and they can spot fake something that is generated by AI. I, I, we, you won't necessarily be able to say why, but you'll just know that this is just too perfectly written or uh, formatted perfectly. And I, one of the folks I spoke to recently said, he deliberately put spelling errors in his emails and his messages to clients and uh, on social media and that to show that this is authentic, real people, not AI. So I'm sure you won't let a single spelling error get through. I try your not to, but the, one of the last things I would love to, to share, Nicholas, is that it is so important on LinkedIn to show your human side that, you know, people really want to know the, the person behind the profile before they do business with you and show who you are, be vulnerable, share challenges, you know, or situations where maybe you weren't successful. You will be surprised at how much engagement you drum up as a result. The whole discussion around personal branding and building your brand, I'm going to ask our listeners to Make a note if they want us to talk about that, because that's a top topic I'm, I'm very excited about and I think it's extremely value as, valuable, as you mentioned. So, Julie, it's been an absolute treat speaking to you, and it's been, it's been a great learning experience as well. And I'm sure a lot of the listeners are going to take some very valuable tips that you've, mentioned to, uh, that you've mentioned today and actually use them, because I know they will work, and I, and I know they work due to some of my own experiences with it. So thank you so much for, for sharing with us today. And I hope to have you on very soon. Well, it's been a pleasure talking with you, Nicholas. And I am always looking to expand my LinkedIn network. And so look, look me up on LinkedIn. Julie Livingston want leverage communications. Yes, that's the last thing I actually had it here on my, on my list here. So your desired CTA. So, and you, you mentioned this as well. So we want to send audiences to wantleverage.com. So that's, that's my where website, we're my send website you. or my LinkedIn. Yeah. And I loved your video there with you waltzing around New York and in fancy offices. Oh, so I that's my that. personal <laughs> brand video. Yeah, I love that. Yeah, so I really, I just, I really actually, I just that. did, I'll send it to you. Um, I just did a PR patter show on personal branding videos with the producer of that. And we, I had a panel on and we talked about, you know, how to communicate your personal brand values through video. Yeah. So you see here we're going on and on and on. So this is, I, this is officially our, my longest podcast, which is, and, oh I my honestly, God, are you serious? I, and I honestly could keep going. So yeah. Thank you so much, Julie. 
and sure. we'll chat soon. Mm, come chat with Nicholas. He'll listen to you. Then he'll laugh and then he'll cry with you. It's all in a safe space for you to speak your truth. Oh.